Welcome everyone to AURI Connects Webinar Wednesday, part of AURI Connects monthly online series featuring updates on the work that AURI is doing to foster long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products. I'm Dan Scogan, the AURI Director of Government and Industry Relations and your host on Webinar Wednesdays. The AURI Connects program is hosted by the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute in Minnesota. This program aims to actively engage all participants in the food and egg industry to improve competitiveness of producers, businesses, and entrepreneurs through ongoing purposeful connection of resources and partners along the value chain and increased knowledge of opportunities, technologies, and trends. Remember, this event is being recorded and archived and can be found at auri.org. Remember that you will be muted during our presentations but you can also send us your written questions through the Q&A portal on your screen. Now, today we welcome AURI team members, Dr. Michael Studelberg and Ben Swanson to give us a better understanding of the work that is done at our laboratory in Marshall, Minnesota. Ben Swanson is from Sauk Rapids and works with AURI clients to help them advance their business or products. And this may include anything from nutritional analysis, locating suppliers or co-packers and more. Ben received his undergraduate degree in chemistry from the University of North Dakota. Dr. Michael Studelberg is a jackrabbit from South Dakota State University, where he received his PhD in chemistry. He leads and manages AURI's analytical and bioproduct laboratories at Marshall. His background includes experience in analytical method development and organic chemistry. So Ben Swanson and Michael Studelberg, welcome to Webinar Wednesday. Thanks, Dan, for the... Uh... Good, great introduction. I would uh, like to start off uh, and, and welcome you all uh, to join our webinar Wednesday. Uh, I'm Michael Studelberg with AUR, AURI, and it's my pleasure to uh, begin uh, discussing AURI's uh, Marshall Laboratories. Before we get started, I want to go through, uh, bef before we get started discussing Marshall's lab capabilities, I want to I want to provide some background information about AURI. At, at AURI, we help develop new uses for agricultural commodities. We were created by the Minnesota legislature about 30 years ago. And our mission is to foster a long-term economic benefit through value-added agricultural products. At AURI, we partner with a wide variety of large and small companies and stake stakeholders in agriculture. Our labs and offices are located throughout the state with our headquarters uh, and microbiology lab in Crookston, Minnesota. At Wasika, we have our co-products lab that includes a vast array of capabilities, including pelleting, drying, oil pressing, oil filtration, and decortication. A great webinar Wednesday was on, on these capabilities uh, was performed last month. In Marshall, we also have our food development lab and food product evaluation and sensory laboratory that offers producers, entrepreneurs, and businesses the ability to assess critical sensory attributes uh, of new food products. And Ben Swanson will be going into greater detail on these later. Additionally, we also, in Marshall, we also have our chemistry labs that are focused on providing quantitative and compositional data to promote the value added products from, make, from Minnesota agricultural commodities and co-products. The analytical lab here also evaluates many sample types, including foods, feeds, co-products, and renewable fuels. We have a great technical team in Marshall that supports uh, the various chemistry uh, and food lab capabilities. Shelby Tuft has been with AURI for almost a year, starting back in October. Ben Swanson, who manages the food labs, has been with AURI for over five years. And I manage uh, the chemistry labs in Marshall. I've been with AURI for about four and a half years. Our technical team is uh, very amazing uh, to work with. And we are in various areas led by our senior director of science and technology, Rod Larkins. In Wasika, we have Al, Riley, and Abel uh, working in the co-products lab, uh, and Dr. Jimmy Gussie uh, is up in Crookston. 
Lolly, a food scientist, a scientist of food and nutrition, uh, leads a food team out of the Twin Cities as well. And here, I'll turn it over to Ben for a few other additions as well. Thanks, Michael. Like Michael mentioned, AURI is composed of both a technical and a business side, led by Jennifer Wagner Lahr, who's the Senior Director of Commercialization. Uh, our project team is the opposite coin of AURI's technical team. Nan Larson is in charge of AURI Connects, uh, leading the innovation networks, such as Webinar Wednesday. Michael Sparby is our commercialization director, primarily dealing with co-products. Ashley Harguth, a project manager for the food team. Harold Stanislavski, a business developer, primarily dealing with BBRE projects. Becky Phillip, who is a project manager, dealing in both co-products and uh, BBRE, Matthew LeFon, same with Becky, uh, BBRE and co-products, and Jason Robinson, who's a business development director uh, for our food team. Next slide. AURI's client services are broad, uh, including applied research, uh, AURI Connects, commercialization services, and technical assistance. Next slide. These client services are brought up into four major focus areas, bio-based, co-products, food, and renewable energies. The bio-based products focus primarily on opportunities for Minnesota businesses to use agricultural products to replace traditional petroleum-based ingredients and materials such as plastics, films, building materials, lubricants, and sealants. Co-products is focused around creating new uses for agricultural waste, uh, or co-products to create new revenue streams. These co-products lab in Wasika is the only value added lab of its kind in the Midwest. The lab is used primarily for development of new uses for plant and animal co-products that present environmental and economical opportunities for businesses throughout the region. AURI's foods area is Dell's primarily with new entrepreneurs and existing businesses to provide consulting and technical services in the areas of product and process development, product evaluation and testing, sourcing materials, and equipment and services. AURI's food laboratories are available to clients for hands-on testing as well, and we'll go into more of that later uh, during the slideshow. And finally, AURI's renewable energy focus area focuses primarily on the production of renewable energies from agricultural products. From transportation fuels to heat electricity, we are working on ways to keep ag-based bioenergy a strong contributor to the state's economy. Next slide. A brief overview of what's available at our Marshall offices, I include our chemical laboratories, our food laboratories, our meat laboratory, and our food product evaluation and sensory laboratory. Next slide, and I will hand it back over to Michael to discuss the chemical uh, chemistry laboratories in Marshall. Michael? Thanks, Ben. So I'd like to get started here on the chemical, the analytical uh, testing capabilities that we have uh, in Marshall. We do a wide variety of testing in all of, from all of our focus areas. Um, and the, the pie graph that we have here um, on the right is a good representation of what we mostly test for in agricultural products. The pieces here of the pie can also be broken down into further chemicals, allowing us to get greater detail as well. The support we provide in the chemistry labs aid each of our focus areas. And I will, over the course of the next uh, few slides, I'll showcase different instrumentation and equipment we have that allows us to perform these tests. The first one I wanna focus on is our HPLC, which allows us to detect chemicals in liquids. It can be seen here uh, in the picture on the left uh, that I'm standing next to. This one main area here that uh, we can focus on is gonna be amino acids. And those are taken from protein content. Uh, we're able to uh, detect those in various seeds, meal, feeds, and food products. This is, a, this is essential to, uh, to know the amino acid content when you're looking at new crops and, what, and how they contribute into different foods and feeds 
for the overall health. Uh, one other aspect here is going to be carbohydrates, or we can break those down into sugars, allowing us to look at free and total sugar content, specifically looking at glucose or sucrose, maltose, uh, et cetera, in, the, in, the different, in different samples. Um, however, additional preparation for these total sugar content would, would probably be required as well, which we can do with Marshall. Uh, besides these, these uh, other tests that I've, I've mentioned, we can also uh, look at small fermentation reactions, uh, looking at specialty uh, chemicals from there. We've helped, um, as part of this, we've helped some small breweries and small companies looking at uh, kombucha, uh, looking at various organic acids in there, which is from uh, fermentation as well as ethanol content. Uh, this is important because some uh, kombucha and non-alcoholic beers have to have a max, they can't be uh, above 0.5% ethanol content. Um, otherwise, it's no longer considered non-alcoholic beer. So we help them by test, we can help them by testing um, their different batches for uh, product development. And we can do some shelf life studies with them to monitor that ethanol content over time and warn them if it's starting to get too high for uh, their, their products. And that is one thing I wanna mention here too. We do product uh, development testing. We're a, a non-certified testing lab. And what that means is uh, you don't, we don't have the uh, accreditation um, of, other, of other third party testing labs um, following, but however, we do follow the same type of protocols and, and test methods. One other testing capability that I want to bring up here as well is looking at hemp, specifically the THC and CBD content in various hemp crops and products. A good example of, of, what, of how we can help uh, and do various testing is um, last summer we collaborated with some hemp growers to monitor the THC and CB, CBD content um, in industrial hemp from the crops flowering to harvest. Why is this important? Well, we can help farmers so they get an idea of how their crops are growing and when an where an ideal area is for them to harvest or contact the Minnesota Department of Ag to have their fields tested for THC and CBD content. Again, this is important because their hemp fields can't be above 0.3% THC. Um, so we can, we can help them. Uh, we're doing some various testing with them just so they get an idea of how their crops grow. Additionally, we could also, we also uh, have produced uh, different test methods that I haven't mentioned here for various clients as well. This is a unique capability. We're able to um, look at specialty chemicals uh, for various clients that may be hard to detect or very expensive if reaching out to a third party lab uh, to, to perform. And we can go into greater detail on, on, on uh, various uh, protocols or if, if people have questions on that uh, later as well. Um, here, uh, additional e equipment uh, and instrumentation we have uh, is our solvent extraction unit here uh, in the, the orange uh, piece of the equipment on the left. Uh, we can use that at room temp or at elevated temperatures and is primary, primarily used uh, for fat extraction. Again, that's part of that uh, pie, pie graph that uh, I, I, I was talking about. An interesting component of this is we're working with the Forever Green uh, team out of the University of Minnesota, looking at new uh, crops, including some oil seeds, which will have elevated oil content or fat content in those seeds. Uh, we've, uh, this allows us, um, th this equipment allows us to look at the oil content and also determine pressing efficiency from an oil press that we have in Wasika for the oil content of these new seeds as well. So a lot of interesting capabilities uh, here as well too. However, from that fat, we can pull that into our GC 
uh, picture uh, here, in the instrument and pictured here on the right, which allows us to analyze that fat for its fatty acid content, specifically, for example, looking at omega threes, sixes, nines um, of, of uh, in that oil, see how nutritious it could be, or what are their benefits? Where, where could it be useful uh, in agricultural um, processes, such as renewable fuels or um, bioplastics as well? Uh, the instrument here allows us uh, to bring gaseous or liquid samples um, into a gas phase by heating uh, without decomposition. And again, I mentioned this instrument is used primarily for fatty acid analysis, but we can also use this for biodiesel uh, analysis, which is going to be using uh, converting those fatty acids um, into a uh, fatty acid methyl ester. So we can look at conversion and, of, of uh, oils into biodiesel as well for renewable fuel products. Uh, and some biodiesel that we have made in our uh, Marshall labs uh, can be seen in the picture on the right using some new uh, various oils too, such as camelina. Additionally, in Marshall, we also have the capability to look at the energy potential of fuel pellets using what we have, what's called a bomb calorimeter. Um, and that essentially does what it, 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 what it means is we end up um, exploding and blowing up um, the fuel pellets and looking at the energy uh, potential um, in those fuel pellets. So some interesting capabilities here that we have um, in Marshall. Additionally, uh, I mentioned amino acid and protein content and the picture on the left is uh, our uh, protein uh, analysis unit. Uh, allowing us to look at total nitrogen content and converting that into uh, protein. Um, we've worked on some different projects and initiatives and grants in the past, looking at uh, creating some protein concentrates. So extracting protein from various feedstocks um, and using that instrument allows us to look at the efficiency of extracting that protein. Um, the instrument on the right is our mineral analyzer, or AA atomic absorption. And this allows us to look at mineral content taken from ash. And ash is created uh, in our lab using some furnaces that um, we heat the samples up to 600 degrees Celsius to get that ash content. And for those who aren't familiar with Celsius, well, that's roughly 1100 degrees Fahrenheit. So it does get pretty warm. And that allows us to remove any organic matter uh, and leaving the inorganic material behind, allowing us to look at um, calcium, uh, potassium, sodium, iron, magnesium, zinc, just to name a few. And this is important because we can look at micronutrients in various feedstocks and, and new, uh, new crops, look at soil, uh, new feedstocks for uh, anaerobic digestion potential, yeah, a lot of different interesting capabilities um, with that as well. And also, uh, lastly, I just want to show some interesting um, or some, some analog preparation equipment that we have as well. A lot of different capabilities, but this is, this is going to be good. This is a cold centrifuge, um, which is important if you're doing some preparation of uh, samples that need to be uh, kept under cold conditions so they don't degrade uh, before you can test them. So that's just one aspect that we have. Um, and lastly here, I wanna talk about some chemical processing capabilities, that we, um, especially for our bioproducts lab. Um, we can do some scaled reactions using our various PAR reactors, which allow us to do um, chemical uh, reactions and extractions under high pressures and temperatures. Um, from a few hundred milliliters up to some liter capabilities. So the, again, another unique capability that we have down here. Um, including uh, from, from uh, these reactions, we also have some, uh, these can go into some of our additional processing, which is um, evaporative techniques and using a rotovap, large separators we have to uh, just clean up the samples and add some purification in there. Uh, again, another uh, main use for this, uh, we've mentioned this a few times, but is some biodiesel uh, synthesis. And we're actually doing um, some work now 
on some new feedstocks for biodiesel, um, specifically focusing on camelina and pennycrest oils and seeing how those could be used um, for biodiesel analysis or for biodiesel. Um, from here, um, the, the, this, this is just a, a brief snapshot of what we have in Marshall. If there are questions um, later on, please uh, happy to go into greater detail um, on the different instruments and techniques that we have. Uh, but until then, I'm going to turn this over to Ben Swanson. He can go into uh, greater detail on the food, um, as food lab aspects that we have here in Marshall. Thanks, Michael. Uh, next slide. So I, like Michael mentioned, I'll be diving into some of the food side or food labs that I'm in charge of here in the Marshall, starting with our general food or product development lab it is a 700 square foot retail licensed facility that is equipped with various pieces of equipment that uh, are traditionally found in commercial kitchens, including uh, mixers, ovens, cold storage, uh, fresh product storage, freezer space, vacuum sealing. This lab is designed to just be a very general place and a licensed facility that clients can come in and do a number of different activities uh, with AURI staff on site. Um, like I mentioned, it's retail licensed. This means that um, anything that comes through here, it can be inspected. We currently have some clients doing market and or market research with a wholesale license. Uh, so they can then make the product, package the product here on site and go sell it to various other facilities or retail spaces, um, however they see fit. Um, another thing that work uh, they can work on here is with their formulation. Scaling up is an instance. Um, sometimes what happens is you just uh, going from making 100 jars of jam to 1,000, 10,000 can really have some kinks in it. Uh, so working with some pieces of equipment, uh, like I said, equipment demo, on site with us here really helps us navigate some of the issues that arise during scale up processing. Um, one thing we're trying to improve upon the capability and expand here at AORI is with some of these having more larger scale pieces of equipment that clients can come in. Sort of a try before you buy kind of a deal. One thing we noticed when working with clients uh, through their various commercial kitchens is not everyone has the same setup. Not all commercial kitchens are created equal. So one thing we wanna do is offer through, you know, various client projects, we started noticing certain products, certain pieces of equipment that were difficult to find. And we are strategically trying to find those pieces of equipment to allow these clients to try it before they make the investment in say, you know, a five, a $10,000 piece of equipment to see how their product behaves uh, using these new larger pieces of equipment. One such thing we're currently in the process of trying to get a hold of is a steam kettle. Uh, it's a jacketed boiling apparatus that allows the quick heating and pouring of liquids, um, say sauces, jams, uh, you know, it can be used to pasteurize juices in smaller instances. Uh, but not everyone has them and they can be quite expensive. So we want to uh, allow or acquire these pieces of equipment to allow our clients to see how their product behaves or changes when they use it um, before they make that large investment. Other pieces of equipment we are seeing a need arise uh, and are possibly looking into getting a new piece of equipment. Uh, we're seeing a lot of new health juices, uh, new um, drinks, uh, shrubs, non-alcoholic beverages that need to be heated and bottled. So we're looking at a possible juice, some type of juice line or some kind of a juice press, um, as well as some bottling and carbonation equipment to allow uh, some small production runs. Um, this would allow clients, not a full scale, they, can't, they wouldn't be doing all their production here. This would allow say, you know, maybe 10 cases of product that they can do market research at trade shows going to distributors to show off their product. Maybe they have an opportunity to talk to banks or venture capitalists to get uh, new revenue streams into their business to further expand. This would allow them to get a safe product uh, that is what eventually they'll be producing larger scales at, 
into, uh, like I said, that market research opportunities. Or just, like I said, general product evaluation. Maybe they just don't know what is going to happen with the product when they do uh, and they scale up. This, again, allows for them to have a retail licensed product to then do any further evaluation on it, whether that's sensory or market research, stuff like that. Next slide. AURI also in the same facility is running our meat lab and our meat facilities at it. Currently, or we used to be USDA inspected. We are, uh, due to COVID, we are looking to get that facility back up and running and inspected. That is pending right now. We are in the pro middle stages of getting that uh, USDA federally inspected. And this would allow for, again, uh, product to be sold nationwide. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, federal inspection uh, versus MDA equal to or custom exempt, um, federal inspection allows for people say from South Dakota, since we are so close to the borders, South Dakota, Iowa, North Dakota, um, to come in into our facility, make product using our HACCP plans, and then be able to bring it back over state lines and sell it. Uh, this would include, again, scale up assistance, equipment demos, say they have a facility, but space is very tight at some of these smaller facilities, and they don't want to have to clear out uh, their entire facility to demo, you know, a new stuffer, a new piece of equipment that's specialized to some meat variety or meat product. This, we have, like I said, the 700 square foot facility, and if it's USDA inspected, this allows that equipment to be brought in uh, using our HACCP plans that we could use the equipment, they could get their product, package their product, slap their label and um, on it, and then bring it back and then sell it in their retail facility or their uh, distributor chain and see how it behave or how consumers like that product before investing in say a, some of these pieces of equipment can cost 30, 40, $50,000. And that's quite a large leap um, to, to, do, to do blindly. We also offer shelf life guidance in the meat packing or the meat industry. Uh, you know, if it's or a shelf stable product, it needs to be under 0.85 water activity. So we work on formulation changes. We just got done with one client who was trying to get a product that is frozen or refrigerated right now. And we are working on various changes to these ingredients to and help them ensure that that product is still shelf stable and meets their quality that they want to put their stamp on and their label on for their business. And again, formulation assistance also applies not only for shelf life, but for the quality of it. With new ingredients coming out every day, we work with clients who say, you know, want to work on nitrate free things, you know, we've worked with in the past, um, using traditional sodium nitrate or nitrile and doing such as sea salt or celery salt or celery juice. Um, that's just one instance of, uh, of working with a client on adjusting their formulation yet still meeting specifications for standard of identity, uh, product quality, sh uh, safety and stability of it. Um, there's a number of things we can work on for formulation assistance. Next slide. We are allowed to do this because we have these small scale pilot pieces of equipment, uh, such as larger scale grinders, cutters, sealers. Uh, over on the right hand side, you can see a fully functional digital smokehouse, a one truck smokehouse. Um, this allows our clients to basically take their product and their facility, come here and mimic the process as best as possible. And we are uh, again allowed to do this because we have these pieces of equipment on site to mimic what a traditional facility has. Again, we are looking at all the time to upgrade our capabilities. If we see new trends coming into the market, uh, we are always trying to be aware of the, what we can do to help expand our capabilities to help meet new entrepreneurs and new uh, clients uh, demand. One thing again with that USDA facility um, we're looking to do is potentially one thing we noticed during COVID, it was the dire need for smaller scale processing. A number of process or processors I've talked to are months and months out for, for small production runs um, and slaughter and such. And we're seeing potentially the need for new facilities to come online. So potentially one thing we're looking at, um, see if it's a possibility would be these small processors while they're getting their facility up and running is 
we can do small production runs of say sausage, jerky, snack sticks, you know, these little things that they can do this market research and build that name brand recognition where we would be able to offer small strategic production to allow them to slowly build that name brand recognition and those sales while their facility is being built up. Um, again, that's why the federal inspection um, is, is key to some of these future plans for the meat side of this food lab and meat lab facility. Next slide. The newest addition to AURI's facilities on campus here is our sensory product evaluation laboratory. It is a space here on Marshall to do a number of sensory, traditional sensory uh, evaluations. Um, not fully what a, uh, some of the, the U of M offers, but more targeted, more early level production. Um, you know, for consumer studies, this involves market readiness. This allows clients to access direct client feedback in a more, more controlled setting than say a trade show or a farmer's market where the setting can be a little chaotic. You have outdoors, you have um, different things that can influence a person, say if it's really sunny, rainy, windy, very loud. You know, they, they, all these little things can influence a consumer's opinion on something. So this facility offers a quiet, very neutral place uh, for feedback. Consumer acceptability, basically this is what when people think, you know, you rate it on a scale of one to five, one to seven, one to 10, you know, this allows them to how much do you like the product and allows them to see, you know, what the general feedback on their product is. We also offer some comparative and difference testing, uh, such as benchmark testing. You know, they if someone has a barbecue sauce and they want it to uh, compare it to a leading barbecue sauce in the market, we can do a side-by-side -side blind comparison to say, you know, if they're trying to say, hey, I want my product to be like X, X's product, we can, you know, do a difference test and to see how well theirs compares to it um, and see if there's really that much difference into it. Maybe if they like it or not better than that one as well. Another form of this testing can be new ingredients, you know, with con constantly changing consumer demand and do consumer preferences, we're seeing entrepreneurs constantly being on their toes for what's what's in, what's new, what's accepted by the consumers. And this allows them to see, you know, if they change this ingredient, does it really change what their product is like? For instance, the gluten-free craze that happened uh, a number of years ago, everyone wanted to get rid of gluten. So, you know, but they still wanted that high level of quality product that was associated with uh, the gluten and, you know, wheat inside of it. So this would allow, say, a consumer to come in, change that ingredient out, and then compare it to their old one and see how much of a difference it is. And if there is a difference, is it a better, is it for the better of the product, or is it for worse? You know, again, this goes for ingredient replacements. Um, sometimes ingredients aren't available. You need to change it. A big price spike happens, you know. This allows them to change out the ingredient and see if it really affects the final quality of a product. And finally, the biggest, I think, benefit of this new facility is just unbiased consumer feedback. We all have had, you know, friends and family uh, have commented on something we've done in our life, and sometimes they're not the most honest, or they may be very, very pulled back on their ingredients. You know, uh, I, I grew, growing up, my parents were always my biggest cheerleaders. Not the best thing when you have a business. You know, sometimes you need the cold hard truth of that product's just not up to stuff. So this, this facility is going to allow these consumers or clients to get direct consumer feedback blindly um, where they can see is if it really is good or if there's needing some changes in the product. So this facility, again, was designed in mind for this smaller scale approach on getting that entry level unbiased consumer feedback. Uh, next slide. One of the benefits of having to rebuild, we essentially took a empty classroom that SMSU so graciously offered here on campus. And one of the benefits, we were totally from the ground up able to redesign this. 
So on the left there, you'll see a prep room that is uh, was built into it. Um, it's positive airflow, so none of that, any smells that come from this prep room uh, end up in to the consumers. Um, all that is, it's negative air, so all the uh, airflow comes out from the consumers and into the room instead of them being unbiased or biasly. Um, it just, it just the feedback doesn't uh, affect anything coming out of the prep room. Again, we can then prep the product on site. Um, if not on site, we have our retail space that we can make in our facility. It's just on the other uh, building or directly below this facility actually is SMSU's colonology department. And they have a wonderful kitchen that we can, if we can't do it on our retail site, we can do it directly uh, with them since we have a great partnership with SMSU's colonology department. On the right there is also an interesting room that allows for more a informal consumer feedback to happen. Um, this is a for more direct consumer groups, meet and discuss the products face-to-face. Uh, -face. With a smart TV, a presentations can be given around the evaluation as well as discussions can be recorded for clients' benefits later on. Um, like I said, that smart TV also allows the option for direct consumer client interaction as a webcam is set up with the TV uh, to allow for live discussion and feedback during that client of, uh, product evaluation. Um, since most of our clients uh, are not in Marshall, uh, Twin Cities or further abroad, this is a great opportunity uh, for clients to just Zoom or Teams meeting in to discuss that and not have to drive, you know, sometimes it's hours and hours away um, to get that direct face-to-face -face, uh, consumer feedback. Um, so while this facility was just opened up at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, COVID has kind of put a damper on this new facility, but with the opening back up of Minnesota and some of our facilities, we're hoping to greater utilize this facility to allow our clients more direct consumer unbiased feedback in the future. Next slide. And uh, I think that will do it for our presentation. Again, thank you so much for your time. Um, AURI looks forward to uh, supporting a number of projects. Uh, if you have any additional information, um, our website is there listed on screen. Our contacts from Michael or I are on the bottom there. Um, feel free to give us a reach out with us. Give us a call, email. A lot of the times, you know, I, I just get random calls from potential. It might not even need to lead to a product. Uh, one of the greatest benefits of being uh, a nonprofit is being able to work with clients and just, you know, make those quick connections. A half hour meeting can do wonders to make uh, a connections for resources. Uh, so we're always here and available. And I believe now we will open up for questions. Is that right, Dan? That's right, uh, Ben. Uh, ben and uh, Michael, thank you very much for the presentation and kind of the overview of uh, what happens at our lab in Marshall and uh, what is uh, available to uh, the entrepreneur and small business person. Uh, we've got a few questions that are coming in, so uh, let's see if we can uh, get to some of those. Um, do you keep a database of your ingredient research that can be then accessed by those who are developing a new food or a new beverage product? Can somebody take a look at something, I guess, that you've been working on and, and uh, well, do you keep a database of your ingredient research? Depends on the product. Um, sometimes, at least on the food side, it's client specific. If it's a proprietary or trade secret of a specific client, that will be kept. Uh, client, you know, that is covered under the, gen the NDA that they sign when we open projects. But we are working on, we do work on larger stakeholder driven projects, uh, such as our Kernza initiative right now. Any and all available uh, material from that grant is available online. Uh, we will, we do publish it. We do have that readily available. Um, say, you know, we, we did a study on how Kernza behaves in the brewing industry. And we have a, a great one pager that we readily hand out to anyone who asks for it. So as long as it's not uh, in summation, as long as it's not proprietary or directly trade secreted by the company, we do offer uh, that uh, type of information or in more general, just general experience working with set ingredients, say a, you know, a plant-based, we work with a lot of plant companies that do plant-based ingredients, such as um, some of those textured proteins. 
while I might not be able to directly comment on, you know, company one, two, or three's process, I am able to use that experience to more generally help out, again, as long as it's not directly proprietary to that company. And they, they added to that just uh, being specific to uh, solving a problem. Uh, if, you, if you develop some or find a, a, an ingredient that solves a problem, do you make that available or does that have to be proprietary to the client you're working with as well? I would say um, a lot of the, the ingredients um, that were that are crops that are new um, are public, uh, and so that information is disseminated. Um, there's a cam, you know, specifically camlin and pennycrest, some new crops um, that are uh, new cover crops. Um, so that that's gonna that's gonna be public knowledge. Uh, but if they're I mean, maybe, uh, Christopher, is there a specific um, problem that you're looking at or just overall um, ingredients? You could maybe give us a follow-up question. Yeah. yeah. Um, but otherwise, there is a, a USDA, um, or right, Ben, USDA or FDA database mm -hmm. on different food ingredients that is also public knowledge as well. Yeah. In general, again, as long as it doesn't directly conflict with an NDA or a trade secret um, with an existing client, we do readily share what we've learned throughout uh, the, you know, our, our work um, with the general public. Well, let me ask, well, that maybe leads to the next question. Do you work in the labs uh, on your own or on behalf of AURI or is uh, most or all of your lab work uh, devoted to client work? We do have some uh, research that we can do um, in the labs um, ourselves, but a majority of the lab work we do is client or project uh, focused. Mm -hmm. How about uh, working in your labs uh, on our own? Uh, I think they might be referring to uh, entrepreneur in residence. Uh, is it possible to get into your labs and work on my products without AURI assistance? Yeah, we do offer what's called the Entrepreneur in Residence Program, which allows um, client, you know, entrepreneurs to be able to work in uh, our labs, be it in the chemistry labs or food labs. Uh, so we do have that availability. And if, uh, if you're interested, uh, please reach out and we can have that conversation and, and look at uh, you know, how to get you in here. You know, even just a, a tour of our, our you know, labs uh, as well. Yep. Same goes for the food side. I mean, we have one client right now uh, who produces, like I said, uses a wholesale license to produce at the facility, completely free of me. Obviously, I'm here for any technical assistance, safety regulation guidance. Um, that's one of the benefits, like Michael mentioned, of our uh, entrepreneur in residence program is you're given access to not just the facility and some of the equipment, but the direct technical assistance of the scientists at AURI on site. I think a follow-up to our database uh, research and ingredient uh, question, a way to just build on the research and be able to share it, uh, added value, he, he added. So I don't know if there's anything else you guys want to add to that or not. No, we, uh, well, again, we, we're putting together, um, for some of these new crops, we're putting together um, a lot of different information sheets. Uh, ben gave a great example of the Kernza um, how, how can it be used uh, to create beer? Um, how is it used in bread and flour? Um, it's nutritional composition. So, there's a lot, so a lot of this is going to be public knowledge and is being disseminated uh, now or has, or has been uh, in the, will be in the near future uh, too. So a lot of those are, those are uh, some of the ways that we disseminate some of the, the public information that uh, we get on uh, some new crops and, and food products. Back to the sensory lab, um, can I get a, a, a food item uh, tested there or analyzed there uh, without AURI's assistance? If it's something I've just developed in my own kitchen, can I bring it in and, and have a sensory test done? We are looking at that type of an option. Again, typically how we would do that is you would have a project with us. Um, it's not readily, so to speak, open to the public to, for general use, but it would be with some guidance 
with sensory evaluations, it's very important uh, to have a guided approach with it. It's not only asking a question, it's asking the right question in the right way to prevent some kind of bias. Um, I've learned over the, you know, uh, just being dedicated to this. We also have, uh, like I said, Jason Robinson and Lolly Okino are, you know, they, through their experience working with it, it, you can kind of shoot yourself in the foot a little bit if you don't ask the right question, because then it can be, the, the, the answers can be skewed towards a certain response. Mm -hmm. um, so typically when we work with clients, we, for a sensory evaluation, we try to figure out what they're trying to learn. You know, what information are you trying to get about your product? And then we design a sensory evaluation around that. You know, what questions do you ask? You know, what questions really would dive into the responses and get that information you need from it? So yeah, we, we are looking to get more publicly available options for right now, but I would say right now it's primarily through a, you would work with us on, on getting your product um, into that facility for, for some of that direct client feedback. Do uh, market developments lead to your lab research and or does your research lead to uh, or help develop markets? And they acknowledge at the beginning of their question that it may be the chicken and egg theory, but uh, <laughs> do you get a sense for which leads which uh, when you're working with clients? Yeah, I'll, Ben, I'll, I'll take oh, yeah. a at this. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of both. We always try to look and see what are the uh, incoming trends, um, trying to see around corners. We're, we do this by talking with our stakeholders, talking with clients to see what, what they're focusing on or what, what they're seeing. Uh, additionally, with these new crops like industrial hemp, uh, camelina, kernza, uh, pennycress, there needs to be a market for them as well. So we have to do some of the research to get um, producers using them, businesses using these products um, in different, different aspects. So there is a market for when these start to build up. Addition, another a good example would be uh, protein. Um, so looking at protein functionalization, um, new uses of, you know, new, um, new, new sources of protein um, from Camelina and Pennycress, uh, pea protein. Um, a good example, you know, additionally, we've, we've also written some reports. Um, there's a protein report on our website and an industrial hemp report on our website uh, as well that you could go look at for different uh, you know, markets uh, as well. Um, but hopefully that uh, answers. We, we do a little bit of both, talking with clients, talking with stakeholders, but also helping um, test products and, and look at uh, commercial, commercialization aspects. Does uh, AURI conduct uh, or hold uh, food uh, safety training uh, seminars and programs? Right now we are looking into the needs of that, but traditionally we work with state, other stakeholders, partners in it, say the U of M, we have some working relationships with process authority members to uh, directly work with, uh, we work with them. Um, we don't necessarily put it together ourselves, um, but we help guide clients uh, towards the needed resources. So say, you know, I just worked with a client on selling, you know, jams and jellies. Um, one of the things they need is a process authority letter uh, to, be, to be safely selling their product. Um, so I work with them along all, all through the steps of getting their product tested, their formulation, making sure that they talk with this process authority person to get their product evaluated, and then they safely through. So we help guide them. That is a very common service we, we offer in, in the food side is helping them guide through the regulations, um, the guidelines to safely produce and sell their products. And then a, a question about how people, uh, entrepreneurs, small businesses, how do they find AURI or how do they find uh, the uh, labs in Marshall? Uh, is that by uh, somebody making a recommendation or can they uh, knock on your door at Marshall and, and uh, get in or what's the process like there? Michael, you want to handle how you guys handle it on the chemistry side? A little, there's a yeah. little bit of a difference between the two of us. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of this is going to be project and client focused. So uh, working with our project team, 
um, to, and, and uh, talking through what you're looking at, um, what do you need to get tested, um, and you know, opening a project with us to, to get, be able to get in, and uh, then we can do those, those tests on your food or egg product um, as well. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you know, word of mouth, um, we go out to various, uh, you know, present, we, we go to different expos uh, as well, and you can meet us there, talk to, uh, you know, the, the project team or, or tech team and, and see how we can help you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Similarly, we start on the food side, you know, just a general conversation, whether we've had word of mouth, MDA recommendations, Commercial kitchens, you know, some people's commercial kitchens uh, just recommend us. Um, you know, like Michael said, there's a number of ways to get a hold of us. Direct contact works a lot too. Um, and on the food side, again, it starts with a general discussion of your business, your product, your process. Uh, sometimes entrepreneurs don't even know what the problem is. Uh, and they can just like, hey, where do we start? And that starts a conversation with them. If, you know, sometimes they don't even need to start a process or a project with us. We have number of just handout, you know, one pagers, electronic links. You know, we can point them in the direction of some really good resources to kind of chew on uh, before they come back with a project. But if it is decided that a project is uh, needed I and mean, they would benefit from one, then we do have an onboarding process of, you know, putting together a workbook, talking further discussions with them to make sure they're getting all the necessary help that they need. Again, sometimes, you know, they'll come to us for just simple nutrition labels, but it, you know, we find out, oh, you might need some assistance with regulations or licensing. Maybe you need scale up or equipment uh, or ingredient sourcing and stuff like that. So these direct conversations can really open up and make sure that we offer strategic and tactical assistance um, to where entrepreneurs need them most. Well said, and I think we'll leave it there today. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for uh, the presentation and for uh, spending a few minutes with us on some uh, questions and answers about what happens in the labs in Marshall. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. That concludes AURI Connects Webinar Wednesday for today. We want to thank Dr. Studelberg and Ben Swanson for their time today. AURI Connects Webinar Wednesday is presented by the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute of Minnesota. AURI's mission is to foster long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products and processes. We are interested in your feedback, so we ask that you please respond when we send you our event evaluations. Remember, for more information on today's program or on any of the work that AURI is involved with, you can go to auri.org. Join us next month on July 14th for an overview of Minnesota's aquaculture industry. Experts will identify and discuss industry challenges such as pairing species with effective production systems, navigating complex regulatory systems, and establishing economically viable operations in the state. You can also learn more about other work that AURI is involved with by going online to auri.org. And we'll see you July 14th for another AURI Connects Webinar Wednesday.